I go like I'm MC or something. Like MC in the some awards or something like that. I don't even know if it's gonna pick up. Mm -hmm. They had audio problems, so. And it sounded fine. Yeah, it looks like it's really low. I can see the output. I don't know if you see the little bar down there. If I you see the green, okay. So I'm gonna hold it here in hopes that it picks up a little bit better than yesterday. So anyway, um, we're going to continue on with the uh, the endocrine system to review for you what we discussed. We discussed some foundations of the endocrine system. We looked at uh, repeating how the nervous system is certainly inter interrelated and associated with the, uh, the endocrine system. It can override it. We reviewed how molecules can be released and under the influence of nervous system, endocrine system, or um, uh, humoral factors as well. So we said neural, tropic, or humoral factors. We also talked about how multiple uh, hormones can have an influence to the target cell, and those influences may be antagonistic or permissiveness. Uh, or um, synergistic with one another. And then we went through and talked about what might be a problem as a result of the endocrine system. We talked about poor concentration of hormones, and we also talked about um, how target cell may not actually respond to the stimulus. As well, um, we kind of outlined what we're gonna do for the remainder of the chapter, looking at uh, the different glands, mostly primary uh, endocrine glands and some secondary endocrine glands the hormones which they release, uh, the primary function of those hormones, and the major mechanisms for regulating the release of those hormones. And then where we left off um, in discussion yesterday was the anatomical relationship between the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary, as well as the anterior pituitary. And so I want to review for you, what, what type of tissue is the posterior pituitary comprised? Nervous tissue, okay? It's just what part of the nerve cells? The posterior pituitary is not shown in this image. What, what part of a nerve is found in the posterior pituitary? The terminals, the axon terminals. So we just, bless you, we just have these little axon terminals with um, neurotransmitters stored in there. Conversely, big difference between the anterior and the posterior. Anterior pituitary is what type of tissue? endocrine gland or glandular tissue, okay? but it's still controlled by the hypothalamus. Okay? So the hypothalamus still, right, nerves extend, but do they extend all the way to the anterior pituitary? No. They actually control it by releasing what? Neurotransmitter neurohormones into the blood system. Do you all remember the name of it? <laughs> Very good. The hypothalamus hypophyseal portal system, a little special blood circuit between directly shunting between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Really nicely oversimplified in the image shown on the board, you can see just this direct shunt of blood. Okay, can you all see it in the image projected? I believe that's from your textbook. And so the tropic hormones in this image are the, the green little dots coming from the hypothalamus. And so if we apply that to the um, pathway which we studied in lab yesterday and the day before, that would be like TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone would be the green thing going to target the anterior pituitary to release the pink thing, which is what? TSH, very good, okay? And so we left off there, um, and I had you guys uh, get ahead because without getting ahead, hitting it all at once today would be a little bit traumatic, so kind of put the trauma aside by completing homework four or handout number four, and um, wanted you to look at the diversity of the number of uh, <coughs> tropic neurohormones from the hypothalamus that actually control the anterior pituitary. And so let's turn and look at page five. Uh, that had you complete that chart, chart over the evening, and we actually did the first row. And so let's just review that chart, and it'll, set, and it'll repeat it with the actual presentation, okay? And so um, if we look at the hypothalamic hormones, okay, we notice that there are seven of them. And you notice that five of them have the suffix RH. Do you see that? We'll address it in, in lecture in just a moment. But the RH stands for what? Releasing hormone. And so wherever you saw the releasing hormone in the next column, you would have written which term? Stimulates. Okay. And the IH must mean what? Inhibiting hormone. So it inhibits. Okay. And so in other words, we have 
releasing and inhibiting hormones from the hypothalamus that cause the anterior pituitary to release or not release a particular hormone. Okay. If you remember, we said four of the six hormones categorically are tropic, and two of them are, are what I will call non-tropic in this course. So if we look at TRH, what's the T stand for in that pathway? T stands for thyrotropin releasing hormone. Be careful that you don't call it thyroid releasing hormone because it's just a vision like your thyroid being released, right? It doesn't do that. Thyrotropin releasing hormones, a hormone that causes a release of another molecule called thyrotropin. Okay? So TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone, we said is stimulatory to which anterior pituitary hormone? Thyroid stimulating hormone. Or we, in lab we called it what? Called it TSH or you called it not thyroxine, thyrotropin, which makes sense. Thyrotropin releasing hormone causes the release of thyrotropin, which is alternatively called thyroid stimulating hormone. We'll use the term TSH, but I just wanted you to acknowledge some terminology differences out there. Um, TSH targets clearly the thyroid gland, and the effect of the um, uh, TSH on the thyroid gland is to, the next column you have, to release the T3 and T4. Okay, very good. The next hormone you have on, um, actually before I move to the next one, because four of these six are tropic, we honestly could add another line here. Okay, the effect, thyroxine is also going right, to have an effect on other tissues, so we could include, we could keep the list going really. Okay. Um, the other hypothalamic hormone, CRH, corticotropic releasing hormone, CRH from the hypothalamus. Effect is what? Next column. Stimulatory for the anterior pituitary to release. Something called ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Okay. We walked through that terminology yesterday. It targets the adrenal cortex. And this one has a whole bunch of effects. And what, what did you guys come up with? What are some examples that you came up with for ACTH? Release cortisol and other steroid-like <coughs> hormones. Right? So it targets the cortex of the adrenal gland to release its steroid hormones. Okay. You might figure out the next one, GNRH. We can handle the RH. What's the GN stand for? Gonadotropins. GN stands for gonadotropin. And the, the N is always lowercase. Okay, so gonadotropin releasing hormone clearly is going to be stimulatory for the anterior pituitary to release things called gonadotropins. And we gave them specific names yesterday. What is what are the gonadotropins from the anterior pituitary? Very good. Luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Okay. So GNRH triggers the anterior pituitary to release the gonadotropins, FSH and LH. Okay. Clearly, we know where these are going to target. Gonads, ovaries and testes, depending on which is present. And the effect. What are some effects of FSH or LH? Ovulation. Female ovulation. Very good. Uh, ovulation, production of the sperm cells, production of the oocytes, and um, release of our sex hormones, estrogens and testosterone, right? They would be gender related. Very good. Next on your list was GHRH. What does the GH stand for? Very good. Growth hormone releasing hormone is clearly stimulatory for the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone. Can you see the simplicity in the nom nomenclature now? <coughs> growth hormone releasing hormone causes the release of growth hormone from the what? What structure are we at? Anterior pituitary. If you remember yesterday, I mentioned growth hormone is both tropic and non-tropic. 
So we're going to look at the non-tropic effect. So where does it target? Bones, muscles, and fats, too, to break them down, to metabolize them. And so I gave an example, um, the effect, fat breakdown, or you could say lipolysis, protein synthesis. Honestly, you could just say increased metabolism. That's what growth hormone does, promotes increased metabolism. So notice now we have our first inhibitory hormone, GHIH. That one's going to be very good. Growth hormone inhibiting hormone inhibits the anterior pituitary from releasing growth hormone. Okay, and because it's inhibitory, the heads up I gave you, we can't complete the next two columns because there's nothing released. There's no effect. So how might you describe the relationship between growth hormone releasing hormone and growth hormone inhibiting hormone? Well, just they're antagonistic. They oppose one another's effect. Okay. The next two, um, one is a releasing hormone, the other is an inhibitory hormone. They're affecting which anterior pituitary hormone? Prolactin. Prolactin. Um, when we release prolactin, what does it target? In the female, primarily mammary glands to promote milk secretion. So milk production, milk secretion. And we can also turn it off you know, via the inhibitory hormone. All right, looks like most of you guys kind of did your homework, so very good. Um, we're going to go through, we're going to repeat this. Want to make sure you understand the pathways and the relationship between the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. So let's go back to our, our guided notes. Um, we already talked about yesterday the anatomical structure that um, it's a blood connection um, between the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. We also concluded that um, the anterior pituitary, the adenohypothesis, does produce four tropic to non-tropic hormones. But if you remember, I said growth hormone technically is tropic and non-tropic, depending on the what? The, the target cell. Okay. And then prolactin uh, is not considered to be a tropic hormone. Okay. These uh, hormones are summarized for you in the handout or the image in your handout. And you can kind of see the nice little summation on the far right would be which hormones. PSH, ACTH, FSH, LH, those are all the tropic, tropic and on the left would be our non-tropic hormones. Okay. You could also see their target tissues. Okay, so you could put the information from the chart, which we just went through, and add it to that image for an alternative way to kind of study uh, the relationship. Okay. What questions do you have at this point before we move on? Comfortable? Uh, we already are now, thanks to handout number four and the work that I had you do in advance, you're familiar with the difference between a releasing hormone and an inhibiting hormone. Uh, stimulatory hormones we'll see as well uh, coming from the anterior pituitary. I do have that table shown, but we've already gone through it, so I'm going to go ahead and move uh, through that table really quickly. We've obviously added more information uh, to that. So let's go ahead and move on and just add more detail to each of those pathways. So we, we've primed ourselves by completing the table, so we'll just add more detail than just associated with that image that we were using um, yesterday and, and in lab. Okay. We're going to start out with our... Um, non-tropic hormones, growth hormone, and prolactin. 
growth hormone. You can abbreviate that GH once you become familiar with the terminology. And it typically is anabolic to most cells and it targets our bone and our skeletal muscles. Yeah, so predominantly anabolic, but it's also catabolic for which tissues as we find out. What tissue could growth hormone be catabolic in? What tissue is growth hormone catabolic in? Yep. Our fat or our adipose tissue. Uh, growth hormone has a catabolic effect, meaning it does what to the fat? Breaks it down. So, and as illustrated there in that last statement, uh, encouraging the use of fat for fuel. So it's just releasing stored fat energy for muscle activity, bone growth, whatever the case may be. We have an idea about its regulation. It's hypothalamically controlled by which two hormones? Very good. Growth hormone releasing hormone and growth hormone inhibiting hormone are going to be our regulators for the release or inhibition of growth hormone, right? So it's, it's antagonistically controlled by these two hypothalamic precursors. Our primary way to, uh, to regulate growth hormone. Just to remind you, we're looking at some of the major mechanisms. We're not looking at everything that's all-inclusive for these pathways. Otherwise, we have to get into an endocrinology class to really understand that. We're just going to do this in about a week and a half. Just work with us. Um, so um, let's go ahead and keep it in practice. You can see the image to the right of your handout. Draw on your image the control pathway. So in the hypothalamus area, which hormone could you write for the release of growth hormone? GHRH. So just in the hypothalamic region, write GHRH. It's synthesized, it's released in the little portal system and it binds to which part of the pituitary? Anterior. And in this image, which side is the anterior pituitary on? The left side. So GHRH triggers the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone, right? It's the hormone in question. Goes in the bl general blood circuit and it targets on the left, right? You can see our bone, fat, and muscle okay, for energetic or metabolic effect. What's the thing on the right? The liver. The liver. Okay. At the liver, that's where it's tropic. Okay. Um, And you can just write IGF. Your book talks a little bit about it, but I'm not going to hold you accountable for it. It's called insulin-like growth factor. Okay, so insulin-like. It's like insulin, so it causes the use of what? It causes the use of sugar, increased metabolism, which ties into the growth hormone metabolic effect. All right, so that's growth hormone. You'll see it throughout your life. Um, what questions do you have about what basically growth hormone does or um, control? It's regulation. Does anybody supplement with this? Good, it's illegal. <laughs> Um, your doctor can prescribe it to your child. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> um, athletes, like performance athletes, like uh, people who do sh like muscle shows, they'll, they'll buy this and they'll supplement with it. Um, it's not recommended, though, because they're making growth hormone, right? Eventually, what's going to happen if they get kind of hooked on this? What's their body going to do? Well, they'll get huge. Their body's going to depend on it, they're going to stop making it, and they stop taking it in their tissues, right? It would have a, a ne really negative effect on the body. But uh, people do take it. But um, parents can go to the doctor. Like for me, like if I'm worried that my children aren't going to be, I know my children aren't going to be very tall, okay? So if I was really worried about it for societal issues, I could take my kids to an endocrinologist. They could get prescribed what? 
Growth hormone prior to what? Do you think that when do you think they should take this? Prior to what? Prior to puberty. Okay. After puberty, after adulthood. What do you think happens if someone takes growth hormone after puberty? After someone's reached their mature point. Muscles and what else? Fat actually decreases. The, what, the bones will grow disproportionate. Okay. And so you may have a condition called acromegaly. Have y'all heard of that? Okay, so where the fingers and the nose and everything looks just really extremely long and big. So um, we don't want that to happen, right? It happens right, naturally, if you will, if someone has a pituitary tumor, but um, synthetically you want to avoid that. Okay, so kind of, so the, the key is to um, give the growth hormone before the person reaches uh, puberty before those growth plates close, okay, otherwise it'll be disproportionate. Okay. Um, you can overdose it though. If, what happens do you think, what condition do you think someone has if they have excessive growth hormone prior to puberty? What do you think will happen to them? They, grow too big and their bones break. they will grow too big, their bones may, bre may break and they we would call a giant, like a technical, by definition, a giant, and their bones would be susceptible to damage as well. Very good. All right, so growth hormone is certainly a very interesting hormone. The next pathway, you don't need to include it, but I was just showing how to turn it off. Growth hormone inhibiting hormone. I have the negative feedback, the dashed line, will stop the release of growth hormone. So just duly regulated uh, to make sure our levels are in adequate, right, or set point range, basically. The next non-tropic hormone I want to address is uh, prolactin. You can abbreviate that PRL. And um, in the females, it's regulating milk production. And we know that it is also kind of dually regulated by two antagonistic hypothalamic hormones called growth, uh, excuse me, prolactin inhibiting hormone and prolactin releasing hormone. So same thing. And our pathways, prolactin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus triggers the release of prolactin, goes into the general circuit. And in the female, on the far right, we can see that's the mammary tissue. Y'all remember what the tissue is on the left that we saw yesterday? The smooth muscle of the uterus. Smooth muscle of the uterus. Very good. It's the smooth muscle of the uterus. Okay? And it also promotes uterine contractions. So ladies, um, if you've had a baby and you've nursed your baby, or gentlemen, if your wife has gone through the same experience, right? When you nurse a baby, right after you have a baby, what happens? Besides the baby getting fed. The contractions, right? You just ma major cramps, right? It's because the prolactin surge that promotes the milk letdown okay, also causes the uterus to contract, right? And so kind of heal the uterus, basically. So um, that's a primary role of prolactin. Um, it has other roles right, as well, but predominantly associated with lactation. We can turn it on, we can turn it off okay, by the inhibiting hormone. What questions do you have at this point about these two non-tropic hormones? Just from the anterior pituitary. Let's now look at our tropic hormones. Because the hormones from the anterior pituitary that we're going to address now are tropic, we're going to repeat this pathway when we get to the next endocrine gland. Okay. So for example, TSH targets the thyroid, so when we look at the thyroid, we'll also see its hormone. Okay. So we'll be a little bit redundant. The pathway that you should be most familiar with at this point is the one uh, for the release of TSH from the anterior pituitary. You can see in parentheses as well the other um, proper name for thyroid stimulating hormone. We learned it's called thyrotropin, which makes sense because of its releasing hormone, thyrotropin releasing hormone. Okay. The influence of TSH of the thyroid we know is going to activate the thyroid to release its hormone. Okay, that's, as the name implies, it stimulates the thyroid. And we know that um, it's primarily regulated by um, thyrotropin releasing hormone from the what? Thyrotropin releasing hormone comes from the hypothalamus. hypothalamus okay. 
but it's also regulated by existing levels of, I have abbreviated here TH, called the thyroid hormone, or you could say thyroxine. Okay. So it's not just TRH from the hypothalamus, but um, if you remember from the image from your lab this week, how thyroxine can be detected by not only the hypothalamus, but also the anterior pituitary. So it's kind of regulated not only by the hypothalamus, but also just existing levels of, of thyroxine, or abbreviated here TH for the thyroid hormone. I want you on your own to complete this pathway okay, on your handout image okay, between the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, and the target. You should be listing uh, for this control uh, thyroid troponin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus entering into the portal, activating the uh, some cells of the anterior pituitary to release TSH, which we know targets what is that thing? Thyroid, thyroid gland to release its hormone. You can write TH for thyroid hormone, or you can write T3, or you can write T4, or you can write thyroxine. It's one of those hormones that's got, I want to say some issues, but that's not the right way. But there's multiple names that we can call it. So we'll come back to the thyroid gland and thyroxine um, in just a little bit. Right now we're just looking at the anterior pituitary hormone. Feeling comfortable with the hypothalamus pituitary relationship? Um, any questions about TSH, thyroid troponin? Uh, the next hormone we need to get really familiar with, we'll see throughout the rest of the semester, a hormone called ACTH, or adrenocorticotropic hormone, or you can call it corticotropin. Again, working through the name backwards, tropin tells it, tropin, tropic is, it may be releasing, but it's what? It's a, definitely it's a hormone that targets another affects the hormone. So tropic can be cortex of something, and more specifically, the adrenal cortex. So corticotropin tells us that this hormone is tropic to the adrenal cortex. I like to throw the prefix in there, adreno, because things can have, multiple structures can have a cortex or the outside, like your brain or your kidneys or whatever, but the adrenal cortex uh, is the endocrine tissue of that structure. And we'll abbreviate that ACTH. Now be sure not to confuse that with ACH, acetylcholine. Okay, so remember, learn the names, then you can apply the acronyms. Otherwise, you'll get all kinds of confused. Okay. So ACTH, do you remember the hypothalamic precursor that regulates its release? Corticotropin is controlled by the release of a hormone called CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. Okay. So corticotropin releasing hormone does regulate it. And as I implied a moment ago, um, the ACTH targets the adrenal cortex to release its steroid hormone. So we said the regulator, right, CRH, is one way. Um, but as well, it's monitoring existing hormones, cortisol, so it's normally regulated by CRH from the hypothalamus. It's also normally regulated from existing hormones called cortisol and other factors like in the blood. So it's also, excuse me, I'm using the wrong term, tropically regulated by CRH, tropically regulated by cortisol, the proper term, or tumorally regulated by high blood temperature, um, 
grow what? Grow blood seeds and other like, things that are in the cabbage stuff. So it's, it's tropically regulated by CRH, which we're familiar with. It's also tropically regulated by uh, cortisol, but also humorally regulated by stress and heat, that body heat, basically while you're sick or something like that. Are you okay with using those terms, tropic, humoral? On your own, go ahead and complete this, this control pathway looking at the hypothalamus and uh, the anterior pituitary. You should have from the hypothalamus, CRH, entering into the portal system, binding to cells of the anterior pituitary to release this hormone that we're, we're discussing, ACTH, goes into the blood and targets the adrenal cortex. What part of this image is the cortex? The yellow portion, okay? Specifically targeting the outside of that, the yellow portion, to trigger it to release we'll see a whole bunch of different types of hormones coming from there, steroid hormones. We can call them corticosteroids, steroids from the cortex. Okay. All right, that's ACTH. Again, we'll, we'll see it a whole bunch for the rest of the semester. Um, the next two hormones are collectively called our gonadotropins, and they are tropic to the gonads, as you guys identified earlier. We also identified that we can abbreviate them with G and lowercase n. And the gonadotropins include follicle-stimulating hormone and something called luteinizing hormone. Okay. And their job is to regulate the ovaries and the testes. So whether I'm looking at FSH or LH, how would I control this release? Hypothalamus releases. Very good. Gonadotropin, releasing hormone. Goes in the portal. Binds to the anterior pituitary to release each, FSH and LH, goes in the general circuit and then targets the gonads. These images are pretty bad. <laughs> so on the far left is an ovary, and on the far right is a testy. Those are the gonads. <laughs> Use your imagination on those. We'll briefly talk about each of these. Um, I don't want to get too entangled in the reproductive system because these are certainly associated with the reproductive system, but I'll kind of give you a little bit um, to understand how each of these hormones function. The first hormone that we're going to study is called follicle-stimulating hormone, and as the name implies, it stimulates things called follicles, okay? And that's a pretty generic term, and it was best or first associated with females and so um, it's talking about the follicles of the ovary. What is a follicle on an ovary? What, what is it doing? What is it? It contains the egg. And what makes it a follicle? It has what? Before then, this will have an effect. So within the ovary itself, not in the ovary duct. Okay, so the follicle does contain the egg or the ova. Hmm. Word follicle, any words kind of conjuring up? So basically the follicle is like a blister, okay, for a visual, okay. So what's inside of a blister? A bunch of what? bunch of fluid, right? So a follicle grows around an egg, so it's a big fluid-filled vat, and it just kind of fills up, right? And so follicle-stimulating hormone stimulates those little follicles in the female, so it promotes the growth of the egg. Without getting into too much to the birds and the bees, but you're probably familiar with that a woman would ovulate one, maybe two eggs a month, right, for if she's not pregnant. And um, the way that they're selected, the proper term is called recruited. Have you used that word? Been in the military, been recruited? Yeah. <laughs> like they're on you, right? Yeah. Follicle-stimulating hormone 
recruits follicles or recruits eggs for what process? For what? In, 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 yes, and in what more specific? Getting ready for ovulation. Okay, so you've got to get those. If you remember, a woman has a finite amount of eggs in her ovary. They're kind of quiescent. And then so each month, some have to get recruited and have to grow that big blister, basically, to get ready. And follicle-stimulating hormone um, is involved with that. So it promotes gamete production in both the female, which I've described, as well as the male. Right? So it facilitates sperm production as well, but it was discovered or characterized in the female first for recruiting those, those uh, ovarian follicles. The gonadotropins will not be present in those who have not hit puberty yet. So it's this surge of these hormones that get a person ready for puberty and they continue throughout uh, one's reproductive life. And so we know that we already described GnRH surge at the onset and then after puberty is going to trigger the release of FSH. So FSH primarily has to deal with the maturation of the oocytes and the sperm cells. Another um, gonadotropin is called luteinizing hormone, and it's abbreviated LH. And it also has its name due to female origin. It used to be believed that these hormones were separate in males and females, but researchers then said no, they're actually found in both males and females. And so just to avoid too much confusion, they've kept the, the terminology, what the more widely accepted terminology. And so luteinizing hormone is going to work in a positive feedback surge prior to ovulation. So it's going to work with FSH while that follicle is growing. And then right before ovulation, there's a huge LH positive feedback surge. And just like huge is the best way I can describe it, just a spike of LH that goes in a woman's blood right before ovulation, and that just is what ruptures that follicle. Boom. It so it gives them pops of blister, right? It's not a blister, but what's released? So in the female, what are we releasing? The egg. The, the egg. Okay, the ova. Okay. In addition to that, luteinize in addition to triggering what rupturing of the follicle and, and ovulation, it also promotes the production of two new hormones called estrogen and progesterone to hope to maintain what? Really what is trying to be maintained after this? Your body wants to be what, ladies? It wants to be pregnant. It tries every month to get you there, right? And so these hormones will help try to maintain a pregnancy in the female. Um, what do you think happens if a woman has a high surge of FSH but no LH? You may have experienced this. FSH causes what? Not quite. What was said? Follicle stimulating hormone does what? In the female ovary? It creates a follicle. LH does what to it? Pops it. Okay. So what happens if you don't have LH? You don't ovulate, and what happens? You don't release it, you don't get pregnant, and ladies, what's that? It's a dis like a condition that you can get. They call it what? It may lead to that. It could cause an infection, though, maybe. You ever heard of cystic ovaries? <laughs> Somebody had those? Okay. Go to the doctor, they can actually physically just physically pop it, or they could give you a dose of what? LH. Okay. So LH in the female actually promotes ovulation, the rupturing of the follicle, and the subsequent synthesis of reproductive hormones, progesterone and estrogen. In the male, it has an analogous role in that um, it promotes the cells in between the, um, the sperm-forming cells to produce the masculinizing hormone called testosterone. Uh, because it was believed that males had separate hormone profile, uh, luteinizing hormone before characterized as being the same used to be called interstitial cell stimulating hormone because it stimulates the cells between the sperm producing cells. 
but we now know LH is found in both males and females. So depending on where you go in your academic career, if you see ICSH, it may still be used, um, but it's kind of an old terminology. The luteinizing hormone is more widely uh, utilized. Okay. okay, so same thing. Since it's a gonadotropin, GnRH is going to regulate its release. What questions do you have over the gonadotropins? Um, FSH or LH? That is like a major crash course into the, uh, into the reproductive system. And these pathways, I do believe, are in the later chapters that I had, like 21, 22, somewhere around there. So if you want to look in those, go to those reading pages for these specific pathways in the endocrine system. Okay. All right, so that actually concludes our endocrine system, or not our endocrine system, but our anterior pituitary hormones. And so we're going to deviate away from the, the brain and go to some other endocrine glands. And we're going to start out with the thyroid gland and its hormone production. And as mentioned, we saw this in lab Monday and Tuesday. And the thyroid gland releases a hormone. In lab, we called it thyroxine. You may also call it, hear it called T3 and T4. The, the numbers are subscript. And that the three and the four indicates the number of iodine atoms making up the molecule. One has three, one has four. Your textbook goes more into the biosynthesis of it, which is important, but I'm not going to hold you accountable for it. I just want you to understand what they, where they come from, what they do. Okay? And um, you have an idea based on a lab that has a whole heck of a lot to do with metabolism. And so I'm going to, we have a list of some things involved with metabolism, promoting processes like glycolysis, okay, an overall metabolic rate. Um, we also learned in lab if something, if a cell or a tissue or an organism is more metabolically active, heat byproduct is increased because we know with each chemical transformation, energy is liberated, so we see increased heat. Um, but you may not be aware that uh, thyroxine regulates, helps regulate your blood pressure some uh, within set point range. Really huge for early growth and development. So um, embryonic and fetal and um, infantile growth. Uh, if thyroxine is not present, so say there's a, um, a, an iodine deficiency in the mother or in the fetus when it grows or in a, an infant as they grow, bones, nerves don't grow properly. So you see profound structural problems like weak bones. Um, men actual mental retardation can happen uh, without proper thyroxine levels. And if you're pregnant, I'm not trying to freak you out. <laughs> it's because you're in America. So you probably have an adequate diet, so don't panic. <laughs> um, not trying to do that to you guys. Um, but it is really critical for um, not just, as an adult, you look back and you think, oh, my metabolism is low, I'm gonna get some thyroxine. It's more important than that. It's more really critical for early growth and development is the point which I'm trying to make. Okay. Um, so overall body development and reproductive system, basically all of your body tissues are dependent upon thyroxine. Uh, indicating oxygen use, which is tying right back to our um, lab, which we um, studied this week. Also makes cells more sensitive to our sympathetic neurotransmitters, epinephrine and norepinephrine, which thusly has a sympathetic effect, so um, heart rate goes up. It's um, synergistic with which hormone there? Which hormone do we see it's synergistic with? This is an abbreviation. Last point. Growth hormone. Very good, right? Synerg synergistic with growth hormone, which makes sense because growth hormone is also anabolic on a lot of tissues and catabolic on uh, energy stores. So we're just trying to make cells become active okay, under the influence of uh, thyroxine. Okay. How do we regulate its release? On the image, you should be able to do this really well. We did it already. If I want to release thyroxine, I can't just have the thyroid gland do its own work. First, what? Thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus goes in the portal, binds the cells in the anterior pituitary, releases TSH, goes in the portal system or in the general blood circuit. 
binds to the thyroid to release T3, T4. And honestly, you could just draw, say, I could probably add in there like your bones, your muscles, blah, 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 Inc increase metabolism, etc. Um, about TSH, let me look at this, I got this half right. Thyroid stimulating hormone from the anterior to the pituitary, it does target the thyroid gland. On the side, let's add, it targets what's called the follicular cells. It targets the follicular cells, that word should sound familiar today. So, what is it, what is it, what does the thyroid gland have? It has these things called, also called follicles. So the TSH targets the thyroid gland. The TSH actually binds to the cells which make up the thyroid follicles. Um, I've got an image kind of out of place, so I'm going to jump ahead to that really quickly so that I don't get too confused. If we look at this cross section of the thyroid gland, on the far left, you can see the thyroid gland right between the neck area. And if we look at a light microscope cross section, you can see the light pink what? What are those? Follicles, big fluid filled blister looking thing. Okay. And if you look around the follicles, you can see individual cells. Okay. So you see the little barrier, if you will. Those cells are compartmentalizing the fluid inside of it, which actually makes T3 and T4. And so these cells are called the what? There's a line right around here. What are those cells called? cells are called follicular cells, and it's the hormone TSH that actually binds to those and helps in the manufacturing of thyroxine. Okay. So this is going to be important for where we're going. Okay. So going back, looking at this pathway, we know that thyrotropin activates TSH, which targets the the follicular cells to release thyroxine, or as described here, the thyroid hormone. It is negatively right, controlled right, by negative feedback, so thyroxine levels go up, and then we just turn off the pathway, which we learned in lab. And you should have filled in on your handout right, this little pathway, okay, and it goes in the blood. Any questions about TSH or thyroxine? All right, another, um, the thyroid gland does not produce only thyroxine, it produces another hormone called calcitonin. And if we look at calcitonin, it is produced not by the follicular cells, but the cells in between, and they're called the parafollicular cells. So if you look in here, this kind of lighter pink area, it's between, can you see the little spaces between? Like right in here. Little areas. They're not making up the follicles, but they're between the, the follicles, and they also have secretory act activity, and they release a hormone called calcitonin, which has something probably to do with calcium. calcium. Okay, and calcitonin is produced by the parafollicular cells, the cells between the follicles. You'll notice the parafollicular cells have an alternative name called C cells, letter C representing calcium or calcitonin. Someone, I don't know who came up with that short name, but they did. 
but anatomically they are just paracollicular cells, also uh, released from the thyroid gland. If we look at what calcitonin does, the name implies tone, like tone, push down. Tone down what? What does it tone down? Calcium. Where? regulated by levels of what? What do you think would cause the release of calcitonin humorally? Too much calcium. Okay. So it's humorally regulated by elevated blood levels of calcium. Okay. So if our blood calcium levels are too high, Calcitonin is released and it goes through our blood and it can target our bones. What else do you think we could target? Well, let's before we move on. The bone to do what? If my calcium levels are too high, what could the bones do under the influence of calcitonin? Absorb calcium. Takes it from the extracellular fluid and puts it in the bone. from the extracellular fluid and puts it in a bone cell. Intracellular fluid, thank you. <laughs> it stores it, right? Okay. We're going to store it out in, the, in this matrix too. All right, so the point is to get the calcium from the blood to another stored location. Okay. It's a primary way that calcitonin functions. Okay. Um, the whole point of that is to prevent uh, a condition called hypercalcemia. What does that mean? Hyper means too much calcium it deep in the blood. Okay. We haven't really talked about calcium, but I think I gave you an idea early in the semester. I said we could probably rename this class the sodium potassium calcium class. Okay. All of those ions are critical. If you have an idea about it in the nervous system, we're headed right there in the skeletal muscle. I mean, every tissue in your body has to have adequate levels of calcium. So we do not want it to be, a lot of times we think, well, we don't want it to be too low. What we also don't want it to be too high. Okay, so we have this uh, hormone called calcitonin to bring it, just think in your head, like do this visual, calcitonin brings it down. Okay? So I'm setting you up, there's an antagonistic hormone that brings calcium up. Okay, so calcitonin brings our calcium levels down to set point. Very good. All right. And again, it come, does come from those parafollicular cells. I'm clear to... Um, says it's regulated, so blood calcium, or you could put what word to be more concise, you could say, what word should I use instead of saying blood concentrations, I could say humorally regulated, and then just by maybe a feedback mechanism. So the stimulus, what stimulus is here? I've got it for you, let me remember, plug, make it humorally. Our calcium levels are elevated, stimulates the parafollicular cells to release calcitonin, goes in the body, and it lowers calcium. Um, it does, on where it says lowers calcium, I really kind of left you uh, hanging here, so it targets the bone, right, for what? Does what with calcium? Absorption. Okay. And um, another thing under your little list, just write in there, it promotes, it lowers calcium by promoting bone absorption. It also promotes decreased absorption from the stomach. Okay. So if you have a high calcium diet and the blood's already high of calcium, you just won't absorb it as readily from the stomach. Okay, so maybe it's there, just keep on going, right? Okay. So lower absorption from the digestive system. And we could also remove it from where? Mm -hmm. Remove it, the kidneys. Okay. Anybody had a kidney stone, calcium? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so. But you know that it, kidneys can actually effectively remove it at the kidneys as well. So we can store it or just get rid of it, basically, if there's too much calcium in the body under the influence of calcitonin. Everybody catch the three things that I mentioned? 
Calcitonin brings our blood calcium levels down. It is antagonistic to a hormone called parathyroid hormone that also is produced neighboring. Uh, and the, it comes from the parathyroid gland. And they are on the back side of the thyroid. And in this image, so this is the posterior. So if I were turning this way, you could see the little parathyroid gland. A little yellow. Or not the yellow. <laughs> the pink nodes um, are the parathyroid gland. And nothing trickery about their name, parathyroid glands, or at least parathyroid hormone. It is also humorally regulated in response to what? Calcium. And probably what levels? Very good. So parathyroid hormone is abbreviated PTH, so parathyroid hormone. And uh, effectively what it does is bring our blood calcium levels back up to set point. So as indicated in the list which I had for you earlier, it's gonna also target the bone, the kidney, and the digestive system, but it's gonna have the opposite effect. What do you think parathyroid hormone is gonna do at the bone? Cause the bones to release? Kidneys to take up, and we'll call it abs absorb. And the intestines also to absorb okay, calcium effectively bring our calcium back to set point range. So all those three hormones come from this little structure right here in your neck. Thy thyroxine, parathyroid hormone, and calcitonin. One dealing with metabolism, two antagonistically regulating blood calcium levels. Why don't you go ahead and write that on about those two hormones and that they are antagonistic, antagonistic to one another. All right, the uh, remainder of the next five minutes we're going to discuss about the adrenal gland and more specifically about the cortex and then um, we won't be able to inclusively discuss it so your homework over the night is to review the adrenal cortex and its complexity and the hormones which uh, come from it so if we look at the adrenal glands oh sorry did we not fill this in is that not on the handout let me back up I'm sorry uh, we said the stimulus the humoral stimulus for the parathyroid hormone is decreased blood calcium levels, causes the release of parathyroid hormone, which effectively brings our blood calcium level back up to set point. And as I mentioned, the primary target for both parathyroid and calcitonin for the bone, intestine, and the kidneys, which have antagonistic effects at each all right, so um, again, we're going to transition now to the, uh, the thyroid, or not the thyroid, I want to go there, don't I? Uh, the adrenal glands, they are properly called the suprarenal because they are where? On top of the kidneys. Okay, the adrenal glands or the suprarenal glands are on top of the kidneys. They're described as being pyramid-shaped or kind of like triangular, and there is one per kidney, and they do sit on top. Uh, it is analogous like what we saw with our pituitary, that it has both nervous and endocrine tissue to it. And so we've actually seen the adrenal medulla uh, when we looked at the sympathetic nervous system. So we'll review that just because it's here. Um, but uh, if you remember, the adrenal medulla or medulla releases our epinephrine, norepinephrine, and our sympathetic effects induced in blood, and which makes it a neuroendocrine gland. And then what's going to be new to us is the adrenal cortex, which is the glandular component, uh, the hormone-producing uh, components of, uh, of the adrenal gland. It's controlled by ACTH, and let's just put in there, and other factors. It's also humorally regulated. 
and other tropic. Okay, so it's got a lot of regulators over it. And we'll clarify that tomorrow. If we were to look at it, um, in the kid, no, we haven't, getting that last semester confused with this. We are going to look at kidneys at the very last lab, and they have had a lot of their connective tissue removed, so we won't be able to see the adrenal glands in them. They've actually been taken out when they've been excised. And um, they're kind of encapsulated with the kidney, so they're difficult to like just see, like that's the adrenal gland. It's, it's a lot more difficult to see. But in this image, you can see the adrenal gland is typically just like, like a hat, if you will, on top of the kidney. So we do a cross section of it. There is going to be deep cortex with a uh, medulla, which is going to be the vascularized tissue that has blood supply to it. Um, if we look at the cortex, it releases hormones, and all of the hormones coming from the adrenal cortex are steroidogenic. So all of the cells have really big which organelles? Really big, moving the arms, very good. Um, and collectively, we can call them corticosteroids, steroids from the cortex. So if you just want to lump all of them, you could just say corticosteroids. But we're going to get into some a few specific examples tomorrow. The three, the um, adrenal cortex, as harmless as it looked in the previous image, is has three distinct layers, and they're called zones. One is called the zona glomerulosa, the other called the zona fasciculata, and the third layer called the zona reticularis. Okay. The first zone or layer produces something, a class of steroid hormones called mineral corticoids. So before you panic a little bit, just work through the word backwards. We'll say steroid from the cortex that has something to do with minerals. Okay? So these steroids have something to do with minerals. The, uh, those from the zona fasciculata release glucocorticoids. So these, again, working backwards are steroids from the cortex that have something to do with sugar, glucose, and other nutrients. And the third layer is uh, zona reticularis produces gonadocorticoids. These are also steroids from the cortex that have something to do with the gonad. So again, just pace yourself instead of like panicking when you see these big long words. Pace yourself through the, the corticosteroids tells us that the steroids from the cortex. And the prefix tells you what they have something to do with minerals, sugar, or an effect at the gonad. I'll conclude today's discussion with um, just a snapshot of the adrenal cortex. The cartoonized image is a little bit easier to see the three layers. You can see the working top down, the outer protective connective tissue. And you can see <coughs> one, two, three layers of the cortex. And then the kind of lighter area, the medulla. And the same thing, if you look at the light microscope, the third, the second, and the third layer. Um, the zona glomerulosa, excuse me, makes this kind of corticosteroids. Mineral corticoids. Zona fasciculata makes for us glucocorticoids. It doesn't make sugars, it makes glucocorticosteroids, the steroids that regulate sugars. And the third layer, gonadocorticoids. Okay, very good. Over the evening, review those three layers, continue reading in the textbook, and, and um, I want you to pass your handout number four to the middle of the aisle, and I'll come by and pick those up.